We are on a mission. A mission to save and revitalize independent pharmacy. On the Catalyst Pharmacy Podcast, you will get actionable business advice, hear stories from industry leaders, and share a laugh with us. Fuel your passion for pharmacy one conversation at a time. So first off, this is the first podcast that we've actually had a guest live in the studio, which is really freaking awesome. And so welcome, Jason Briscoe. Yeah, thanks for having me. I, I feel a little bit of the pressure of being the first in person, but <laughs> yeah. very appreciative of the opportunity for sure. We have fun all the time just talking dinners when we see you and uh, or whenever we would come visit you um, in Ohio. So it's just act like it's like that. It's actually super weird. It's going to take some getting it's used to. So, so there were a time before the pandemic we actually envisioned, you know, we'd have guests and we'd fly them down um, and, and kind of more there talk thinking, a, a, you know, kind of a pharmacy leader strategy and, and, um, and then other things kind of took precedent. And we kind of talked about that and then, then the pandemic happened. Yep. And then we decided just to start the podcast anyway for, because I mean, we enjoy these conversations and we missed them during trade show season because a lot of these conversations we'd have, like we would come visit you and then we make our way to Ohio for Ohio Pharmacy Association. And so. Well, you see a lot of conversations about pharmacy and stuff. And so um, history with Jason Briscoe, we go all the way back with you to the discount drug mart days. Um, Walk us through like, how'd you get started in a pharmacy and then started with discount drug mart and now you're with STC. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So I I guess what you guys can, Cut me off where you want to ask additional questions or not, because I, I don't want to like. How did he ramble get a second two- kid? <laughs> we, we can get there, um, but yeah, I, I um, went to High Northern University. Oh, I grew up in Weirton, West Virginia, which is just outside of Pittsburgh. What is it called? Weirton, W E I R T O N. Weirton, Weirton, like Weird Town. Yeah, so, some may say, but that. instead I, of town, it's tin. Weird tin. Weirton, W E I R T O N. Weirton, Steel Town. So just Weirton. outside okay. of Pittsburgh. Um, okay just east of the Ohio border. So you have Steubenville, Ohio, Weirton, and then Washington, PA, where you can literally get from Ohio through West Virginia into PA in about five minutes. Um, You know, often gets cut off on weather maps, but, you know, very proud in the town that I grew up. It's a different place than when my mom and dad were raising kids and a different place whenever, you know, their their parents were raising kids because of the steel industry. We've seen what's yep. happened um, with that industry. But long story longer, I uh, went from Weirton, West Virginia, and went to school at Ohio Northern University, which is in the other side of the state mm-hmm. of Ohio. Graduated in 2002 um, and took my very first job out of school um, with Discount Drug Mart. Um, at the time, I was single, you know, wasn't really connected um, to, to anyone or any place. Certainly had some student loans to pay back in, in the uh, southern part of Dayton was a really good market for folks wanting to have uh, their pick of where they could go and practice, but also make a decent salary on a path to paying some of those student loans back. And, right. and I interviewed with um, a, a lot of uh, the community, you know, retail pharmacies. And one thing that was unique about Discount Drug Mart was the gentleman that interviewed me and actually my brother, um, they got a two for one deal at that time, um, was the gentleman that I ultimately be working alongside. So the regional pharmacy supervisor for that market was who took the time and come. Now, was that Pete? That was Brian Goshi, who okay. I'm not sure if you Brian guys Goshi. have I don't know that man. crossed paths with him or not. I was about to say, I don't think we ever met your brother he, when we came to visit. Jared, visited. yeah, he's an independent pharmacy owner, a okay. Kelp Pharmacy pioneer user um, in the western mm-hmm. part of, of Ohio. Um but yeah, Brian Grossi falls off to Pete Ratz's tree. Um, they were actually partners way back when up in Northeast Ohio. But I, th- I thought that set the right tone um, with me that, you know, they were very pharmacist focused and mm-hmm. proof was in the pudding that there there was a pharmacist, you know, telling me what I could be looking forward to. Um, so uh, I took a job with Discount Drug Mart as a staff pharmacist at, at, at Store 58 in Centerville, Ohio. And I did that for about a year. The gentleman I worked alongside uh, decided to relocate, so I was given an opportunity to be a pharmacy manager or what we call a chief pharmacist. And I did that for about six months. And this is, again, 2002, 2003, where there was somewhat of a pharmacist shortage. um, And staffing was really 
hard to come by. Um, so the gentleman that Brian, who hired me, you know, he needed uh, some additional help with recruiting and some supervisory activity um, to split the market of Columbus and Dayton. Uh, so they asked if I would be a district pharmacy supervisor, which really was a glorified floater pharmacist that would work any shift, any time, anywhere, with some recruiting and supervisory responsibility. But but more than anything, I was, uh, you know, a glorified floater, which ultimately paid dividends when a couple of years later, Brian wanted to go back to the stores, wasn't interested in continuing on that path because that was pretty tough treading at that time, you know, a, as a supervisor being responsible for a market that was a little bit disconnected from home base yeah. in Northeast Ohio. Mm -hmm. Columbus and Dayton was a relatively new market, uh, which was cool, but we didn't have the depth of resources and 250 pharmacists to draw from when the, right. when the stuff hit the fan. Um, so he went back to the stores and rather than re replacing him, they asked if I would just take over that, that entire market as the regional pharmacy supervisor, um, which I was always been motivated by advancement. You know, yeah. I, I tried in my mind, I, you know, I, I want to be a leader who happens to practice pharmacy more than a pharmacist who tries right. to lead. And right. Pharmacy is a passion, but maybe not as much as people and leadership and so forth. So this is exactly what in my mind I wanted and why I would bust my butt to pick up extra shifts or take away pain from the gentleman that entrusted me to bring me on with Discount Drug Mart. So the glorified floater position, which I don't mean to use as a derogatory term, paid dividends because that entire market got to see me in action, right. right? rolling up my sleeves and working alongside not just our pharmacists, but also our pharmacy technicians. Yeah, uh, I remember walking yep. into a pharmacy with you when you were showing us around initially and you just like jumped in, you saw like there was like a line and they were behind in the queue and you just jumped in and started checking and going. And it's like, okay, you got them caught up while we were over here looking at what they were doing in Pioneer and that kind of thing. So yeah, I, mean, yeah, I got to see you in action. <laughs> I'm glad you caught me on a good day. <laughs> um, but that street credibility, you know, paid dividends because they got to see what I was all about mm -hmm. type of person that wouldn't ask them to do something I'm not yeah. willing to do myself. You know, if there were times where, there needed to be a kick in the butt. They knew it came from a place of trust and that I would catch them in a moment of doing something good. Or if their kid was in a high school playoff game and they didn't you yeah. know, have an opportunity to have that day off, I would go and cover their shift. For, you know, little things like that that mm. turn in nice. yeah. to big things down servant the road. Servant leader. More, I, more of a servant leader. I, I try to be. I, I really do. And, you know, I think when you continue to invest in yeah. – people, not that there are strings attached with those mm -hmm. investments, you tend to get it back in, in no, return. I, so I love that. if I can't do it myself, and that was a balance that I had to strike at some point is, you know, once I got married is I can't always be the person that slides down the fire pole to go save right. the day. At some point, I need to grow as a leader and lean on my team. And knowing I developed some equity with those folks along the way, made it easier to pick up the phone and say, you know, hey, yep. Sarah, would you mind covering for I do Scott? Miss, I do miss the fire pole. <laughs> yeah. So I, I did the um, regional pharmacy supervisor uh, probably for six or seven years. Um, and that was unique in a lot of ways because, again, we were somewhat removed from the homeland of Northeast Ohio where Discount Drug Mart's brand is strong to yeah. the point where if you build a store, they will come. It was a little, you know, slower to grow based on brand recognition and, and who we were in those markets. Once somebody came through our doors for the first time, they would continue to come back. Um, and I, I think once a pharmacist or a technician would come to work for us, retention was really high because of the investment in our folks and recognizing it's not about the logo. It's not about our process. Although we want to try to stay within the same guidelines, it's about our people. It's a, it's about letting, you know, our pharmacists be pharmacists. And this kind of drug mart family owned. Y yes. Sir. The guy who started it was a pharmacist. Yeah. So, right. So really, and, and now it's employee owned, right? Is yes, that yes, sir. So yep. really cool story back in 1969, one pharmacist, one store, uh, Parvis Bouje, who ultimately, you know, grew, 
the company, you know, one store, one community at a time to, to now where we have 78 okay. community pharmacy locations. Um, in my tenure, you know, we invested in making the transition to mm-hmm. Pioneer RX. We opened up a contact center. We stood up a central fill facility. We're a warehousing chain that buys generics direct from manufacturers. Yep. So, and, and Mr. B, you know, was very forward thinking in a lot of ways, you know, from, if you look at the footprint of our stores, we're, when I continue to say we, even though I'm no longer there, but I have so yeah. much love and respect for. Yeah. How many years were you there? 21. Oh, wow. 21 wow. years. Yeah, crazy. It, nothing but love and respect for that organization and all the opportunities they provided mm-hmm. me. So, so you worked your way up in there. Yep. Um, what was, what was the transition from you from there to STC? I transitioned from the supervisor to the director that required Allison and I to move up to Northeast Ohio. Because you were a director of pharmacy when uh, you guys went with Pioneer. Yes. Right? And that was, well, a long, that was a long time ago. Yeah. So I was director for the last nine years or so. But what was kind of unique about the transition from supervisor to director was in and around the time that we were transitioning away from Condor to Pioneer RX. So Tom Namath, my predecessor, was still on board you know, for a period of time, which gave me the ability to kind of yeah, focus on right. it. Because the, when, when we first came up there, when they called us up there to do a demo, it was immediately after NCPA. And so I had to switch a bunch of our flights to go straight from NCPA in San Diego to um, Ohio. Um, and so... Come back to Texas. Yeah, every time you mention Ohio, nice he voice. starts singing Bowling for Soup. <laughs> that song, Come Back to Texas. Um Sorry. And I don't remember you being in that meeting. I do remember Tom and then, of course, Pete and Keith and uh, PJ. PJ, yes, yep. PJ. How is PJ? So I haven't, talked I haven't, to her? I haven't talked spoken to, to her lately, probably been a, a year and a half ago, but I, last I talked to her, she's doing very, very well. Living tra- and loving and traveling a lot, spending time with her kids and grandkids. Nice. But yeah, that was the uniqueness is, um, you know, Pete. Obviously, right. our SVP of pharmacy is still there, um, mm-hmm. but Tom was the director. I was going to be his heir apparent. PJ was the VP of IT. Keith was going to be her heir apparent. So Keith and I kind yeah, of kind really of got up. to work closely on a very important project that, again, back to the street credibility thing. Is Keith out of therapy yet with you leaving? Yeah. <laughs> Well, he invited me to play on his Thursday night basketball team, so I, I still get to see him okay. on a regular basis. Yeah, so he, they- he was ticked off, but yeah, he's... He's doing good. I mean, just, you know how things are, right? you know, yeah. one hour becomes the one day and then one day becomes the next week. So he, I think he's moved on just fine, but that was, that was a unique opportunity. That was sort of a blessing that I wasn't needed to be in the director role, but I could really focus on the prior right. rollout. Yeah, I was smarter than, so I got to really work closely with Keith, got to work closely with you guys. And then also got to work very closely with the largest chunk of all of our storage, which was Northeast Ohio, who they didn't know what I was about. So mm-hmm. kind of like the floating pharmacist back in the day with me being front and center from sometimes 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. to ensure we got off on the right foot at store level with our team during the rollout. And kudos to your crew as well. That was the you know investment in letting people see what I was about about then. Um, That's awesome. Yeah. Okay. So now let's, we'll go to Jeff's question. So now STC is knocked on your door. How did that transition come about? So, um, yes. How did that happen? Sure. So, you know, along the way, when I, when I moved up to Cleveland, we, Alice and I hadn't had kids yet. That was a big investment for her moving away from Cincinnati where her friends, her family, her yeah. career was she flight attendant for Delta yep. at right? the time, flight attendant with the Cincinnati Reds, which is a pretty cool gig. But we uprooted and went to Northeast Ohio, where I didn't have a ton of friends per se, but a core group of people I knew via right. Right. work. Um, and I think I've shared with you guys in the past, we tried like, you know what, to have children. You know, we're pregnant a couple times, but things just didn't yeah. work out. Yep. Um, and we got to that stage. I know it sounds cliche where we looked at one another and said, you know what, we love one another and, and we're content and... So she, she decided that she maybe wanted to maybe live downtown, you know, or closer to the city because right. we hadn't had kids. And we started to look at places downtown. We realized real quick we weren't cool enough to live downtown. <laughs> we just kept working our way west. And yeah. long story longer, um, the hitting coach of the Reds used to play for the Cleveland Indians, hooked us up with a really cool realtor that ultimately found a house for us in a town called Rocky River, which okay. was a great spot to land, but still an uphill battle for her 
in making yeah. that transition. Um, but ultimately, Hazel June came along a, a couple of years. And that later. was it. Y'all quit trying, basically, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah we we came. You're like, hey, this isn't going to happen for us. Happens. You, yeah. yeah, it's like eh, quit stressing about okay. it. We we let go. We and, quit stressing. And understood that we had a lot of blessings in our lives as it was, and we we liked one another and loved one another. And yeah, it's just and amazing to think stress can do to you. Yeah, yeah. You know, just stress of trying so hard. Yep. You, you know, I knew a lot of people when we were in that age group where everybody seemed to be having babies who were like, um, try, 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 and then they like give up and start trying to adopt, and then they get pregnant. Yeah. Yep. Have kids. Yeah. So 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 Ed. Hazel? So we have Hazel, Hazel June. Hazel June. She, Hazel June. She's, she's now six. She'll wow. start kindergarten, or excuse me, first grade in the fall. What a joy. She My is. daughter's getting married this weekend. I know it. Kaylee. So, yeah. Yep. She, was it the, the Royal Blues or the Regal Blues? Regal Blues. Regal, Regal Blues, Blues for yep. Louisiana Tech. Yeah, mm -hmm. I remember you telling me about that. Um, so we, we were so thrilled and so blessed to have Hazel, but to fast forward to about nine months ago tomorrow, um, Hazel now has a little sister. Harper Marie, Harper Sue, Marie, okay. who came again later yeah, in life. Which you sent me pictures, well, and they are so adorable. Oh, she's a, she's got red hair, which every, I know the fiery teases. red hair. I loved it. And if you ask Hazel, she, we don't know where it came from. You know, I said, well, I got a little in my beard, I think. But yeah, but no, well, that's like my husband. He's he's when I met him, it was red. It, it was not red, red like as fiery red, but it was more kind of a strawberry blonde. But there was red, and everybody in his family was brunette. Yeah. And it was like, where did this come from? And then, it, of course, fast forward, he's got little cousins, exact same. The oldest one is a redhead and the younger is a brunette. And he's the only redhead in that circle. <laughs> so it pops in somewhere. Yeah. But that, I mean, they're, they're doing great. Um, so that that was, to answer your question in some ways, just giving you a back history of so some, little some of the what impetus a, what a for joy. change. So are they the same? I guess, oh, nine months old. You're really There's not gonna, like a you're not six gonna years tell. apart. You're not going to tell much now. Well, I mean, you can yeah, tell the Little girls are so different than little well, boys. It, yes, and, yes and no. Um, I mean, you do see a difference between two kids, even if it is two girls or two boys, because... The pregnancy is different. Um, well, the, they talk about those first two months or the, so. Uh, the first year so of their life, they, they do things differently. Like Kenzie would sleep through the night. Cohen was fussy through the night because he had problems with his ears. Yeah. And so there's there's always little differences, but both of them were happy babies. But, I mean, did you notice any differences in the first year versus, I mean, yeah. between Harper and Hazel? Hazel, I mean, I obviously six years worth of, you know, evaluating her personality, but she's, she's you gotta to not forget what it took to break the first one. Just remember <laughs> she, that cake. She, she smiles. She smiled more as a little baby than Harper has. And not that Harper is, you know, unhappy, but she's very serious. I mean, and anybody mm. that meets her, she just kind of looks through you like where you can tell that something is going on there yeah. where she's sizing you up so oh how funny it's really cute now i think she's going to walk before <laughs> she crawls because she just absolutely oh, that yeah. refuses happens. Yeah. to crawl yeah, that was Kaylee. mackie would do that to cohen she would um like you want your bottle well come on you got to stand up here stand up on the cabinet and then she'd give it to him and then mm -hmm. he'd sit back down and then and she would stand like i watched this and i took pictures there was a glass door and so she stood on the outside of it with his pacifier and got him to stand up and then walk back and forth on the glass door. And he was walking at 11 months. Okay. Close to 11, but she didn't walk. Yeah, I'm sure they grow up to hear kind yeah. of the differences. I was listening to a comedian this morning talking about the difference between girls and boys. And he was talking about, I got two boys, you know, and my, my, my brother has two girls. And the girls come over and it's just like night and day. You know, they're like, you know, hello, Uncle Joe. <laughs> we would like to color. Oh, and yeah, then they, you sent And then they that. sit down and like, and he said like two hours later, you go in there and they're still coloring. And it's like, it's like, where are the boys? He, he, no, are he they, was like, where are my, where are my are the boys? boys? Are they're they like, in the house? I don't know. <laughs> are they on the house? You know, find them outside and they're the like, oh, street. we broke our crayons. So we, we put them in the mailbox. Yeah. You know, it's just, it's just crazy. I'd like for Hazel to color for two hours in a row. Difference. Yeah. Kaylee didn't like to color. I don't, <laughs> don't know what. Mackie is. would color for five minutes and then she'd start breaking the crayons in little pieces and tear all the little papers off. It was, she was challenged by the whole line thing. She could, it's very much a perfectionist and whole trying to oh, color the line lines and try over. to do it right and all that stuff. It was just, it was just too much. She was just, yeah. yeah she Hazel's just, left handed, which is difficult for me, just helping to teach her write or dribble a basketball or whatever, you know, but. Harper, we think, is right-handed so far. But. All right, so what lured you away to STC? So 
great people at STC Health too, and, and I had the uh, luxury of getting to know them pretty well. Um, with them being a you know vendor partner of right, ours for discount drug mart. Um, but then along the way, about 2020, uh, they put together a group called the Navigators, um, and it's it's vendor agnostic. But they Sounds were like a bowling league. They were the <laughs> impetus for this Navigator group which essentially was, I don't think it's completely unique, but, but somewhat, somewhat unique in that it brought together public health and community pharmacy. And okay. in the very early stages... It's a great combo right there. The, the conversations were centering around, you know, what the pandemic response will be. And then with STC Health, a lot of their bread is buttered with, you know, vaccines and vaccine intelligence. Mm-hmm. Yep. You know, and all pharmacies were really curious about what the vaccination rollout would be. This Navigator group, you know, really brought together people from all across the ecosystem and created a safe space just to have conversations. So it isn't necessarily a group today that, you know, lobbies or does pull through actionable items at the end, but it's a place where NCPA, NACDS, APHA, NACHO, uh, you, you name the acronyms, you'll have representation. And, and those, those conversations were you know, every week with a whole bunch of people online because everybody's trying to figure out where you would mm-hmm. would fit in. Yeah, there was um, a lot of stuff going on then. And, and that that involvement really helped us at Discount Drug Mart. Um, being a tweener with 78 locations, we didn't have 200 to directly contract with the CDC, you know, for the federal retail pharmacy program. Right. Didn't have a GPO that had an appetite to you know, have more than 200 locations go together as a group. Because of grocery GPO, right? Yeah, GP, yeah. like wh- whatever the the legal requirements would have been to have this kind of point entity to allow for more than 200 locations across multiple locations to contract directly with the CDC for access to vaccine via the FRPP. So when we started to see the writing on the wall, you know, that's whenever we got real close to the state of Ohio and anybody that would listen from the local public health, state public health governor's office, because while we don't have 200 stores, we tell a pretty good story in the state of Ohio with 78 locations marching to the same beat with a single point of contact. That, so we were blessed in that at Discount right. Drug Mart, we got access to vaccine January, middle of January of 2021 and have had access to vaccine, you know, ever, ever since. So, you know, past experience with them as a vendor partner, navigator group, getting to learn, learn a little bit more about them, dovetails into the heroic efforts of our pharmacy and te- techs. And that's not unique to Discount Drug Mart, but awesome job. We wear multiple hats. There's not too many layers. You know, right. With Pete Ratz is running yep. the show, kind of his right-hand guy. You know, I was really motivated by insulating him to focus on business development and relationships and so forth. And got a lot of moving parts on what it takes to be a successful pharmacy and a successful growing by adding locations um, outfit. You know, three or four pharmacy supervisors, a director of clinical services, part-time director of pharmacy compliance that wears another hat in the organization. Not a ton of layers, but you still have all the requirements that it takes to operate what we do. So just professionally and personally, I was really turned on by the ability to play offense the way that we did with the pandemic response, not to, to go back there. Cause you know, in, in many ways, you know, I I've said before, we don't daydream about pandemics, but boy, what an opportunity for community pharmacy things that yeah. we've always talked about is, yep. are there way f- ways for us to provide care? And by the way, generate meaningful revenue right. in helping our patients, our community, et cetera. Um, so, and it was a complete team effort, but kind of the, front person for everything vaccine response related, whether it was media or interfacing with the governor's office, Department of Education, FEMA, because we, you know, took care of people in a lot of different settings as wow. a, a regional pharmacy chain. All right. So, so you become this vaccine person. And so uh, were you looking for something new? Did STC figure they needed something new? You? I mean, no, I, I, I wasn't looking. Um, but I I think Harper coming along, you know, frankly, maybe in my subconscious, the door was open. Um, and I'm not somebody that's, uh, afraid to work. And I, I certainly, um, was willing to do what it 
took to continue to be the director mm-hmm. of pharmacy. Right. So it wasn't something I was running. Yeah, you're certainly not a job uh, from, hopper at 20 years. So no, yeah, we don't have to, no. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so respectful of the opportunities that I was presented there. But I have peace in that I gave them everything I had yeah, while no, I, no, I was no, there. I um, so I, I think just you know, professionally, it afforded some opportunities to maybe focus and play offense. And while I love the diversity within everything that came my way and the role that I was in, maybe the ability to impact not only at a local level, but across the country was attractive to me. Um, some of the the benefits personally, and, and maybe not so much for me, but for Allison, Hazel, and Harper. For the family. I was about to ask, related. so that means you're not, you're less, you're going less around Ohio checking on pharmacies, but you're staying in one location. Oh, he's going to Irving, Texas. <laughs> this week he's in Irving, yes. Yeah, so it, 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 I've traveled quite a bit. Like Probably a, going to Arizona. Two weeks ago Where I was in. tried not uh, to die from heat stroke. Right. I was in Washington, D.C. two weeks ago doing Congressional Hill visits. Interesting. Oh, cool. Last week I was in Phoenix to spend some face time. At so the if, office. um, for anybody who doesn't know, um, STC, uh, develops, uh, first of all, develops a lot of the software that public health, that state health organizations, state pharmacy use to track that vaccinations have been completed. Right. Do you know how many States that is? Yeah. So there's Our every, jurisdictions? every state uh-huh. has a, uh, immunization information system, you know, commonly described as a registry. Some States, depending upon the way that they're set up or their size have, more than one. So there are 64 immunization information systems or 64 jurisdictions okay. across the country. And how All many of those are STC? 15. Right. So 15 of those. Yep. And then STC is connected to? All of them. All of them. Yep. So that, that, um, go ahead. As of which now, I guess North Carolina was a holdout of connecting anybody for a long time. I think North Carolina is connected now. And so, and then also STC helps pharmacies, mostly large, mostly chains, right, connect to those registries, correct? Yeah. So I, I think, um, you know, we were the very first immunization registry. I think it was Arizona, say, 30 years ago. And, and over the years, there's been the development of an IIS in, in every state, some states having multiple jurisdictions. At the same time, probably over the last 10 to 15 years, STC was very forward thinking. It's like, okay, we have the back end acumen and working with public health, which can be challenging at times yep. to stand up the immunization registry. And the 15 that we have is a consortium based model, which adds a lot of value for the states that are part of our consortium. But at the same time, the light bulb went off that, boy, if states have a requirement to report, we want to make sure that we can do that, you know, seamlessly within workflow, intuitively at times with healthcare providers. So yep. doctor's offices and EHR, school nurses, community pharmacies. And we work with community pharmacies of all shapes and sizes. And I think the last that we looked, we have 80% of all pharmacies really? that report to the individual jurisdictions, um, you know, via STC Health. Nice. So, so yes, uh, we do have relationships with uh, the large national chains, several of the regionals. You know, our relationship with Pioneer RX is a very strong one from a channel partner perspective, which allows, um, you know, really benefits for your pharmacies in that you've developed this great solution within workflow that creates flexibility, but allows us to have access to independent pharmacies via this right. channel partnership. So there was a time Pioneer was the only independent pharmacy software. Have you added more independence now, or is it mostly? Yeah, there, the- there's two or three more, and that, okay. that's something yeah. that we want to continue um, to improve on um, j- just to make sure that an independent pharmacy has the same ability to conveniently collect, connect and check that box of reporting from a compliance perspective. And I think the pandemic and the vaccine response was a catalyst for, you know, the need to Ding. report. <laughs> yes. Shameless plug there. So if you wanted access to the vaccine, you had to check the box of remote temperature monitoring, right. reporting administered doses to the IAS, which then were on a path from that IAS up to the CDC for dose level accountability. So, uh, you know, the more pharmacy management systems we connect to, the more pharmacies that would have the ability to, you know, report conveniently. Um, But that doesn't necessarily, like, we don't always have control of the user interface and and how it's built. And 
again, I mean, I'm, I'm with you guys today at Pioneer RX, but the engine that you have built or we've built together, you know, not surprisingly is very pharmacist and pharmacy technician minded yeah. in that, in my view, it's very important not to determine when the perfect moment in time is to expose something that needs to be filled out from a data entry perspective. Yep. So if you can, as naturally as possible throughout the course of a regular prescription, fill in the requirements that are on a path to an IIS, fantastic. If there are additional requirements or fields that need to be reported that aren't there naturally, then you can expose them. But you guys expose them in a way that gives them a chance to pick and choose well, yeah, maybe I want to see it data entry, but don't make it a requirement there. But it can't not be a requirement if it gets all the way to the point of sale. So allowing your pharmacist and technicians the ability to choose when it's best for them to fill yeah. in those blanks is a beautiful thing. Yeah, so, and hopefully lots yeah. of pharmacy software is doing that because immunization, I think, is critical for, um, for pharmacy. pharmacy. Period. You know, it's rolled back a little bit with um, zero copays that uh, some of the Medicare has done. Right. Uh, but so, yeah, there was so, a there was a slide that I used to get from Lauren. I, I that we would put in our slide deck for the, um, the trade show. So if they asked us about vaccines, we go, yeah, we work with a company called STC, and it would it was a, I love this slide. I need to get an updated version. But basically, the slide would show you know what states are doing what the onboarding process is per the state that they're in. And then also if it was bi-directional. Yeah, whether that jurisdiction was bi-directional right. or, unit yeah. or single direction. Yeah, I need to get an updated one. But the stuff on the periphery, the administrative work associated with vaccine administration, let's take care of that for our pharmacists and techs in a way that doesn't slow them down or is not, yep. not demotivating. So that's where, you know, vaccine operations were very mindful of making that as easy as possible so long as it's a requirement to report or hopefully even if it's not a requirement pharmacies understand the value of getting that information to the IAS because now that we're moving away from COVID vaccinations coming out of our years at the same time as flu last fall et cetera, et cetera, that was a tailwind for community pharmacy yep. in the way that it helped to generate revenue. It helped to increase why we're relevant as health providers. And awareness providers. that I can get shots in my pharmacy. No doubt. Right? Right. Whether that's a shingles vaccine or now RSV that's coming out. or Well, and we've we've done a little bit of trying to help pharmacists with that communication with their patients, with putting that. Just a little giving bit? Me, uh, we've got the first kind of step of, hey, you're um, – your medications are ready. Your, you know, we should probably talk about shingles or you know, flu shots are ready or that kind of thing. So yeah. So crystal ball, what's coming? What is coming? Ooh, in yeah. Where where where's where's community independent pharmacy going? Where's vaccinations going? So what what you guys were just describing is you know understanding that you know community pharmacy found the time to take care of a whole bunch of patients whenever we were needed the most. So the, the lights were bright, the stakes were high, the environment we were operating was less than ideal with a vaccine or vaccines that had really difficult storage and handling. Yep. I mean, yeah. We stepped up, you know, and that's mm -hmm. why it, to me, it, it, we just have to continue to bang that drum that community pharmacy is a healthcare destination. What more proof do you need than what we've done in the past with flu shots, some adult vaccinations, but my goodness, 302 plus million COVID vaccinations when other healthcare providers didn't even have their doors open. You know, not only were we open, right. not only did we yeah. remain to be community pharmacies and everything that goes along with that, making sure people continue to get their medications. We weren't vaccine spots that happened to be community pharmacies. We were community pharmacies that picked up the ball and ran with it. And yet there's still this, you know, not confusion, but maybe, Lack of understanding that we are the logical place to expand right. clinical services, right. you know, whether that's scope, whether that's policy, whether that's payment. I think we're starting to turn the corner. We have to just continue to prove ourselves. So you're up in Washington. What, what, are, you, what are you talking about? So, um, you know, what we were talking about there was more on the public health side, but I, I never miss an opportunity to talk about community pharmacy and in where there aren't as many COVID vaccinations right now for community pharmacy, there is an appetite to continue to do good by our patients. Yep. And, and that, again, will help our bottom lines, our relevance, so we're built to last, et cetera. So when you start talking about patient communication and engagement, so wouldn't it be cool, and I know you guys do this, but 
not only are you taking an opportunity based on somebody's age and what medication they have to see if they're due for their shingle shot, but if you can inform that communication more precisely and knowing that even though they didn't get that vaccination at that pharmacy, it was given somewhere it else, at the doctor's office reported at or, the IAS. Right. Therefore, you just decrease the number of outbound messages you have to pay for. Yep. You saved a little face with your patient or yep. an inbound phone call that yep. would come in saying, wait a second, do I really need a third shingle shot? I just got it last, you know, so, but, but there's also the ability for us to curate the information that's in the IAS to then serve it up on a T to show you where the gaps are. So as a pharmacist that maybe is or isn't motivated to do more vaccinations, the last thing you want to do is serve something on a T for them to go talk to Mrs. Smith and she provide a negative feedback that I already got that, you knucklehead. Yeah. Right. You know, you don't want yep. to demotivate right. your pharmacist further. So on the I Hill... The closing the loop of the conversation, not just between other pharmacists, but with the doctor's office too. Just like, yeah. hey... He was getting to the on the Hill. On oh, the no. Hill. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you for drawing that diagram for me. But uh, we... <laughs> We, I talked a little bit about that. Um, the topic of vaccine um, for children came up a couple of times. Interesting. And, you know, I, I believe there's plenty of opportunities for pharmacy um, to pick up the ball with routine adult vaccinations. But I think a lot of what I mentioned earlier related to doctor's office, pediatrician's offices mm -hmm. not being open, a lot of care yeah. didn't take place. And that's not necessarily a shot at them, but there is the need to catch up on a lot of right. vaccinations. Well, and a lot of that's in addition brutal. to for kids, for kids too. Yes. Yeah. Well, I ran into a weird one because um, I always take my kids to get their flu shots, and sometimes I'm like, okay, well, their doctor's appointment isn't until December, so it's October. We're going to all get our flu shots, and because Cohen was diagnosed asthmatic, the pharmacist said, okay, well, I can't until he's 12 years old go do a flu shot because he's asthmatic. It has to be done by his allergist or his pediatrician. Yeah. That, I, I don't know if that's a specific state. I thought it was scope, weird. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if it was a state or that pharmacy had a particular protocol that, yeah. Yeah. that maybe yeah, she may have had I, a, I thought it was weird. Right. She may yeah. have had a practice agreement. Yeah. That, that's something like that. But right. But that's so you look at, you look at the real opportunity, in my opinion, and, and this is what's shown public health. You know, a lot of your public health problems are in your more rural areas where they don't get, they really ought to have more resources and they get less resources where the doctor may come once a week, you know, at a certain time. And he's in his, you know, it's a line running right. out the door of uh, people lining up where Lovely pharmacy well. would be the would be the place that that ought to happen yeah, the, in the, healthy children are healthy adults. Yeah. The, the engine is built. I mean, the experience is there. We've proven that, that we can, we can do that. Um, you know, so to me, it's just, it, it's very, very logical that that just continues to expand and, and maybe VFC vaccine for children's wouldn't be for all pharmacies, but I think pharmacies that deserve the opportunity to play a role if they would like to, but the pushback, you know, we receive isn't necessarily, you know, very pharmacist friendly. And, yeah. and I understand their, you know, scope creep, right. et cetera. But is there not enough work to go around? Are we really satisfied with what vaccination rates are? And VFC is a very successful program, thousands of VFC providers, but there's only 300 or less that happen to be community pharmacy. And there, there's a reasons for that, the way the system right. is currently constructed. And really your, your analysis shouldn't be in your scope creep. You know, your analysis shouldn't be, you know, taking money away from, well, you know, they're taking money away from the pediatricians. Well, no, you're trying to expand care. You right? are. And, and, you know, pharmacy interoperability is another topic we, we discussed. And, you know, maybe that solves some of the ills related to, well, if this child happens to get a vaccine at a pharmacy, then we might miss out an opportunity on a, a well child visit is the classic example. But you know, could we not spin that in a way that, no, we are an outlet for you right. to ensure yeah. that somebody that is getting vaccinated here, A, why is it that they're uninsured? You know, should people in our country be uninsured? Is there a path we can help them get to the right resource to potentially get yep. coverage? And oh, by the way, I noticed that you're coming here and we're thankful for that and, you know, we'll, we'll take care of you. But when's the last time you had a, a pediatrician visit or a primary care visit? And I, I know that that has been you know, loosely discussed and we need to kind of further define. Oh, in a public health, as the pharmacy, you have to get paid for that vaccination. 
and you ought to get some kind of success payment if you can get that child to see a pediatrician. No doubt. Right? Oh, About yeah. helping them get there. You yeah. know, that's what public, a lot of public health is, is, is people getting paid, social workers are, are people trying to get people to get the care they need so that things don't get expensive. Right. You know. Yeah. Um, and what, I mean, you guys know it. I mean, what, what a, a logical place to be a quarterback on behalf of patients. I mean, you know, if it's a, you don't know when somebody's, the, the moon and stars are going to align and they're like, today's the day I want to get my flu shot. Well, it's pretty cool that they can go to your place at Tuesday at 8 p.m. or Sunday at 1. That, that accessibility, the flexibility, the scalability of pharmacy is just so logical to me that if we want to see, you know, vaccination rates improve, yeah. that's the place to go. But that's let's not the stop there. What is, other problems do you have, public health? Like, what yeah. what else are we trying to solve for? Well, I mean, that's the biggest thing is doctor offices are only open Monday to Friday, nine to, and some, and it's like sometimes Tuesdays, that's the day they're closed. And as a mom who's running s between soccer schedules and that, the flexibility of Saturday, a game is finished, texting the pharmacy and just going, Hey, did you get flu shot? And yep, cool. We'll be there. I need yeah. three shots. And then I walk in the door <laughs> and it's ready. It, but as you, that schedule you talked about, as you move to more rural areas, right. and then I say rural, maybe, you know, 10,000 something, you, you, you end up in worlds where that doctor may work four days a week in three towns. Yes. Right. Yes. So he's I get into this that town in on a single day. Right. And when he's happening there, it's big, mm -hmm. you know, why in the world are we doing vaccinations in an environment like that? Yeah. You know, we, when, were, we were approached at, at drug mart, you know, based on the relationships we created um, with public health along the way to be an extension for STI clinics that in a rural County, but they only had two clinic days, like a week or a month or something, where they just said, hey, could you be an extension of our yep. process? And yeah, you're open. Yes, we can. Right. And here's the protocol, and this is what we need you to do, and we could check all those boxes. So I, it doesn't have to only be vaccinations. It could be other problems that need to be solved well, with public health. Yeah, and the, the whole test to treat thing, you know, in those mm. communities yeah. where just not a good use of a doctor who's only in an area a couple of days a week. Um, to have right. a line of, of people pharmacy. who might have flu. Right, or, right. Go to right the now. pharmacy it's just, for a flu test. It's just silly, and and, and we have to figure out a way to get past, you know, the everybody trying to hold on, which is mine, which I understand because yeah. government's cutting everything all the time, sure. and PBMs are cutting everything on the time, and you want to hold on what you, what you have. But you know, I've always been the opinion if you do the right thing, right? This is the Zig Ziglar, right? If you help everybody get what they want. You're going to get, get what, you, what want, you want, right? And yeah. and so you got to get that mindset helping. So so did you feel like your trip to Washington was it productive? Did it was? Um, it's the second time I've done hill visits with the team from STC Health, um, and the first time it, it's it felt a little more meet and greet. We're here as a trusted resource. If and when issues arise, um, you know, in your congressional office, know that we have boots on the ground not only with public health experts and epidemiologists, a community pharmacy, you know, we're pretty, we're very well-rounded from that perspective. We're not just an immunization registry. We're not just a connector from a pharmacy management system to the IAS. You know, we will, really are a well-rounded, you know, public health focused healthcare company. This time, um, conversations centered around some of the debt ceiling negotiations, which ultimately led to the CDC taking a haircut in the funds that they have at their disposal. Interesting. Which ultimately is going to impact the amount of funding um, to IIS. As an example, there were several programs, and again, this is kind of ongoing and negotiating on where those cuts will take place. But when you talk about the IIS and the infrastructure that we had um, that continues to need need improvement, you know, let's not stop what we've invested. If, if we're yeah. two thirds of the way done in building something that could be helpful right. for public health at large, but also helpful for getting information back in the hands of patients and their healthcare providers, that's the only people that have that patient level access. It's not some national registry where your employer is going to have access to that. Right. That's not it. The information the CDC needs and deserves is you know, more generalized, de-identified information to help you make decisions down to a zip code level. Marsha, you're falling down in your job. What is IIS? 
Immunization Information System. System, okay. Yeah, so registry. So there's this new exchange that's trying to be built that being funded by the CDC. Is that what Well, it, yeah, the, the, the work, um, the immunization gateway work isn't necessarily new uh, per se. And this is where I'm getting out over my skis a little bit. But, but essentially, you know, STC, 15 of the 64 jurisdictions, anybody that's responsible for managing and being the back end of those jurisdictions is now responsible for creating connections between IIS to IIS and IIS to Immunization Gateway, which essentially is the CDC. But the way that data flows between, you know, a Pioneer RX pharmacy to the IIS patient-specific information yep. would be slightly different than the information that would be shared from one jurisdiction to another and shared ultimately to the CDC. So some of that work requires funding and, you know, the states don't want to bite the hand that feeds them because the CDC ultimately funds what happens at the state level right. in order to help the CDC do what they need to do from a national perspective. But there is, you know, n- not necessarily us, but there's going to be strong lobbying efforts to ensure that those dollars continue to flow to the states so they can continue to do what is expected of them, not only from their core day-to-day functions, but with data modernization, data quality, some of these new connections, et cetera. So that, that was a lot of what we talked about. So the new title, you're Director of Pharmacy for STC, is that right? I think it's Director of Pharmacy Operations. Director of Pharmacy Operations. Yeah. And you don't have any pharmacies. Correct. So so what is that? Give me the top five bullet points of Ooh, your job description. Five's pretty deep. Um, Sorry, give me four. Nah. Job description. You know, I th- so I think number one is... They said, know, we need a pharmacist to do what? Business development? Is We want to ensure that... Um, you know, we're operating the way that our pharmacies would Mm -hmm. expect us to. So making sure we do what we say and and say what we do. They have a new position. Uh, No, there's been some pharmacists they've had had on in the past. Yep. Um, Sam Stolpe, I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. And Mm -hmm. Billy Chow, who was with Bartels. He was there. I didn't know he was there. And we have He's with McKesson now, I think. No, that's Peter Koo. Peter Koo. Billy's with an outfit um, prescriptive, I think. Okay. Yeah. But Christina Schwartz, who came from Bartell Drug at the time that Rite Aid had acquired Bartell, she's on my team. She's a director of clinical solutions. So we have two I like pharmacists. Bartel. Yeah, me too. I was very, yeah, me too. It was, it was a big boo. Um, so yeah, ma- making sure we do what we say and, and say what we do, you know, understanding what products and services we have and ensure that they're aligned with what the market needs. So product alignment. Mm-hmm. Um, what, do you, what do you think? Um, is, is there a feature you think that pharmacists need that they're not getting? I, I think, um, you know, we do a great job with vaccine operations, yeah. having folks check the box of reporting. Um, we create that bi-directional connectivity to the IAS. Therefore, that can help inform, you know, closing gaps in care. So I, I think, you know, where there will be work that's ongoing is ultimately, okay, we've helped you identify this gap in care. Now let's help you prioritize who you're going to have a conversation with next. Not, not to say that any patient would be left behind, right. but if you have to make a decision on what's going to occur next in your pharmacy, you know, a vaccine confidence score as an example. Hmm. And then if there's information that is funneling into that vaccine confidence score, for you as a pharmacy to determine how you're going to take steps next. But if somebody is on the lower end of the likelihood to be vaccinated, help to expose the reason why. So maybe they're homebound. And maybe if you knew that, you would have a different strategy in how you would go about engaging. You ought to have a different reimbursement. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, that goes. With there ought to be thing. some kind of confidence score slash reimbursement. And that was something else that came out of the Hill visits um, related to um, – one congressional office that's going to introduce a bill again around vaccine for children and their solution to improve the program wasn't necessarily the expansion of providers, specifically community pharmacy, but rather help further compensate the physicians that are in the VFC program for the education associated with vaccinations, which I don't disagree with. I think there's going to be more time that's necessary to get people over the hump when it comes to vaccines, but to me, it was interesting that they're going to get the office visit, the vaccine administration, but what will really move the needle 
isn't adding other providers like pharmacy, but if you just pay us more for having these conversations. Right. So, so yeah, I, we ought to be yeah. having the conversation anyway, but <laughs> yeah, right. if you're going to pay us, we're going to print another sheet and that we're going to put in your hand. Maybe that uh, evolves to payment parity for pharmacies and, and we deserve to be paid for that as well, you know, but yeah. right. Cause was, it's not in what we're normally doing. Right? right. And we ought to, we ought to get paid for something we're not normally doing, but you know, vaccine isn't just a needle on somebody's arm. You know, it, there's some conversations that probably take place with mm -hmm. patients ahead of that. So um, what is a step that you think, um, you're a pharmacist, what if some, if a pharmacy is not doing vaccines, what would you say, or like, what would be your advice for I why get boo. into vaccines? <laughs> I know, but we do have some pharmacies that are we not do. doing vaccines. What would be your advice for why they should be doing vaccines and how to get started in vaccines? Yeah, so I, I'd probably want to. I it's always all try about to look the through money, money. I try to look no. through things from uh, other folks. Like, like for example, <laughs> you know, maybe not every opportunity that out there is a good fit. So, do you want to be yeah. really good at twenty things? You're going to be great at five things. So maybe it's a conscious decision that they have some other niche that they don't mm -hmm. want to distract from because they are just gangbusters in oh, these yeah, other areas true. that right. this might slow them down from what their secret sauce is. Um, but if they're looking for additional ways to remain relevant as a community pharmacy, do good by the patients and your community and oh, by the way, is the way to generate do additional yeah. revenue. Right. I think that's a, a very logical place to start because there aren't a lot of additional layers that haven't completely been solved for related to contracting and payment. Whereas I think we have some road to hoe with point of care testing, biometric screening, some of these other services that are in the wheelhouse of pharmacy, but it's not figured out completely and neatly. And, you know, certainly from a reimbursement perspective, that's lacking. So I think pharmacy because of what we've seen with flu shots some adult vaccinations and then what happened with the covid pandemic is just a, a great place yeah. to start you, you know I, I was thinking one of the interesting things is more and more you know we think about vaccination and pharmacy and older people we think about shingles and hey they need the flu and stuff like that but a lot of younger people now unless their employer makes them don't have primary care doctor uh they don't know that it's time for my tetanus shot because nobody's keeping up with that Right. And, and so if you if you think about as care gets cheaper and if they may, if they get a, a sinus infection or something like that, they do one of these fifteen dollar. They text the doctor and the doctor that doctor's not going to tell them, oh, yeah, by the way, uh, you're due for your tetanus shot, which can be serious. You know, you get out of whack your tetanus and there's there's other shots that have a recurring stuff like that. So we really have to be figuring out how um, I almost think, you know, this. Well, you know, maybe if. You know, it's in their plan. I think a pharmacy should be vaccinating. I, I think yeah. if a, a, a pharmacy that's going to have a future, pharmacy but, that, that's that's going in the future, that's going to be a health destination. But also, that age th demographic isn't necessarily going to a pharmacy. Yeah, that's a good point. But they, so, they I mean, are they when they get the flu. They, they drive they're, by one most They're going for their yeah, sinus yeah, infection. Yeah. yeah. That that's and more and more that's where they're gonna go. You know, they're gonna they're gonna text a doctor in a in a box and they're gonna take a picture up their nose and they're gonna get an antibiotic for sinus infection, whether they have a sinus infection or a cold, and they're gonna go to the pharmacy and they're gonna get it. All right. Uh, so but, as a wrap up though, yeah. Yeah. you you are very involved in operationalizing vaccine programs um at Discount Drug Mart. Yep. Right. We we actually and, have and, a registered and, trademark where we are the immunization destination. In in a very community oriented fashion so what advice as a wrap-up would you give to a pharmacy who's doing a vaccine program today or thinking about doing a vaccine what, what are some of the key portions of a successful op successfully operationalizing yep. a vaccine program? having a relationship with stc health for okay. starters and making good, sure good that, plug that we 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 help you with your vaccine operations and then are helping you maybe even more importantly on informing your closing of gaps and where the opportunities yeah. are um but you know, I think you want to have a, a mindset of flexibility. We were all day, every day, walk-ins wel welcome, except mm -hmm. when, you know, the P word came along right. and we needed to be for the sanity of our pharmacy staff and for our patients have appointments. Yeah. So the balance of when I said the, if the moon and stars align and somebody's willing to walk in on a Tuesday night to get their flu shot because whatever reason it was yeah. happening, the last thing you want to do is be able to say, I'm sorry, you're going to have to come back and make an appointment. Right. Ha have the flexibility. You're going to have to make an appointment yeah. or you're going to have to go see your GP. Create the bandwidth and understand that that is patient care. That is creating 
uh, I don't like this word, stickiness with your patient. Mm-hmm. That's, and maybe some things are going to change related to the reimbursement associated with putting pills in the bottle. But I, I think there are too many pharmacies willing and able to do that, which is some of the reasons we're in the situation that we are, not to excuse any of the activity that's outside of our control based on a number of, but I don't know that there, there, there are too many pharmacies willing to do the right thing, such as right. vaccination and other clinical yep. services. So I think flexibility is make it a priority and understanding that your customer, your patients, you, you want to be very flexible for them. So do your best that you can in creating the ability for walk-ins welcome. At the same time, if you can work with STC Health and Pioneer RX or whomever else it may be to automatically identify where these gaps in care are, to then engage in an automated way that might not even include human beings, that because you have this patient who trusts this avenue to communicate them with, to say, Mrs. Smith, I noticed you scheduled your flu shot. Why don't we take care of your tetanus while you're here? I mean, yep. n- nothing novel or you guys probably haven't heard before, but the more you can make that automatic and boiling it down to that interaction between the pharmacist and the patient at that time, taking away the administration stuff yeah. on yeah. the periphery, that, that's what we need because from a revenue and tailwind perspective of where those opportunities were, you have to dig a little bit deeper to find them. And mm-hmm. I don't think you want your pharmacies to go fishing for them as they're looking at somebody's profile. Yeah. It's, you want the system to kind yes. of do it for them. Yes. But but there's a you got a big difference there between I vaccinate and I'm a vaccinator. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. I vaccinate means oh, we keep them. Um, you know, somebody comes in and wants it, we'll do it for them. You know, I I, I check the box. I vaccinate. Being a vaccinator to, is your- I'm a vaccinator. I'm actively trying to help people that don't have the appropriate vaccines get them. I'm educating them. I'm flexible with my time frame. I have an active role in operationalizing vaccination in my pharmacy. And, and that's the difference. And, and, and to me, vaccines on the way to that license are a great place to start it. If you can't operationalize a vaccine program where I am a vaccinator, um, I have a vaccination program. You're not going to be able to do the other things you need to do. You're not going to yeah. be able to move into test and treat. You're not going to be able to do the other things that are going to take pharmacy into what they are today to what they are going to be tomorrow. When that little redhead's breaking some hearts. So, all right. <laughs> yes, that, we're out of time. Yeah. So uh, let's wrap it up. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I think so we're going to go to dinner. Well, and, and thank you for making the trip up here to yeah, actually no, be in person. No, I appreciate it. Was it. Weird. This is exciting. <laughs> thank you for watching the Catalyst Pharmacy Podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, please like, subscribe, and follow us wherever you get your podcast. Give us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts to help us reach more pharmacy professionals like you.